We continue our studies back to Bethlehem by looking at the story of Anna, of which there is a short account in the second chapter of Luke's Gospel. And because it is so brief, I will just add a couple of other readings from the Old Testament. We begin with a reference to the birth of one of Jacob's sons in the 30th chapter of the book of Genesis and verse 12 we read and Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son then Leah said I am happy for the daughters will call me blessed so she called his name Asher And then we move on to the Song of Moses near the end of his life as he gave descriptive accounts of the sons of Jacob or Israel. And he says this in Deuteronomy 33 verse 24 and of Asher he said Asher is most blessed of sons let him be favoured by his brothers let him dip his foot in oil your sandals shall be iron and bronze as your days, so shall your strength be. And then we move to the New Testament itself and read this from the second chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 2 verse 36. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about eighty-four years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in at that instant, that is, as Simeon was uttering his wonderful words, which we know as the Nunc Dimittis, coming in at that instant she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And then, since this episode has particular significance for Christian women, our sisters in Christ, I'd like to read a hymn by one of the most uh, wonderful Christian hymn writers among the ladies in our hymn book, Francis Ridley Havergal who wrote, Lord, speak to me, that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thy erring children, lost and lone. O lead me, Lord, that I may lead the wandering and the wavering feet. O feed me, Lord, that I may feed thy hungering ones with manna sweet. O strengthen me, that while I stand firm on the rock and strong in thee, I may stretch out a loving hand to wrestlers with the troubled sea. O oh, teach me, Lord, that I may teach the precious things thou dost impart, and wing my words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart. O oh, give thine own sweet rest to me, that I may speak with soothing power, a word in season as from thee, to weary ones in needful hour. O oh, fill me with thy fullness, Lord, until my very heart o'erflow in kindling thought and glowing word, thy love to tell, thy praise to show. O oh, use me, Lord, use even me, just as thou wilt, and when, and where, until thy blessed face I see, thy rest, thy joy, thy glory share. Wonderful words. And I think Francis Ridley Havergal is my favourite lady hymn writer of all time. There are many others, but she very particularly. Now after Mary, Anna the widowed prophetess has the honour of being the first recorded woman to have met Jesus. Although we are told little about her, every word is inspiring and instructive. First of all we consider Anna's name. 
It is common knowledge that Bible names often reflect some truth about God. Anna is the Greek form of the Hebrew Hannah, meaning grace. It is the feminine form of John or Johannes, itself probably derived from Johannan, meaning Yah, or Yahweh the Lord, is gracious. Since Jesus is God the Saviour incarnate, we may justly say he is the grace of God incarnate. How appropriate, therefore, that one named Anna should meet him and become the first woman missionary. Then we consider Anna's associations. Luke tells us that she was the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Phanuel is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew penuel or penuel, meaning face of God. This is the name Jacob gave to the place of his lonely wrestling encounter with God. For he wrote, I have seen God face to face, Genesis 32. And did not lonely Anna see the infant face of God incarnate? Anna was also of the tribe of Asher, which means happy or supremely blessed, as we've seen from Genesis 30. Although Asher was one of the so-called lost tribes of Israel, Anna's presence in Jerusalem in those spiritually dark days confirms that God's gracious election was operating. Romans 11 verse 5 Since she shared in old Simeon's joy, adding her own praise to his nunc dimittis, who was more happy than Anna? Next we consider Anna's age. Luke tells us that she was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and this woman was a widow of about 84 years. Scholars differ in estimating Anna's precise age from Luke's details. Since Jewish girls often married as young as 14, if she was married for seven years, Anna was possibly now 14 plus 7 plus 84 equals 105 years of age. This is not impossible, since Luke specifically says she was of a great age. Alternatively, since, according to Psalm 90 verse 10, even 84 years may be regarded as a great age, Anna was probably nearer 84 than 105 in view of her obviously active life. Either way, she was a remarkable old lady. So the blessing of Asher was fulfilled in her. As your days, so shall your strength be, as we read in Deuteronomy 33. Next we consider Anna's activities. As we have already noted, she was a prophetess. Apart from the reference to the evil prophetess Jezebel in Revelation 2.20, Anna is the only one referred to by name in the New Testament. This is not to forget Philip's four daughters, Acts 21, or the fact that Joel's prophecy included the prophetic function of sons and daughters in the New Testament church, Acts 2.16. It is important also to note that together with John the Baptist, Anna's activity is evidence of the revival of prophecy after a silent period of about 400 years since Malachi. We must also note that even this revived gift was temporary until the New Testament revelation was completed, as Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 13. When perfect scripture was finalized, prophets, both men and women, became obsolete. Nothing therefore may be read into Anna's activity regarding the ordination of women, which is not biblical at all. On this the scriptures are very clear, as we learn from 1 Timothy chapter 2. Luke further informs us that Anna did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. 
verse 37. This could imply that she occupied quarters in the temple, or that she simply attended every service. Thus she probably spent every waking moment in fastings and prayers. Such was her devotion to God, and the spiritual needs of others, she virtually lived there, or so it seems. That said, we must resist the temptation to see Anna as a kind of prototype nun, a lifestyle which not only emerged later in the Middle Ages, but was also pagan in origin. It is clear from verse 38 that she was neither confined to the temple nor cut off from people outside. Fourth, Anna's attitudes. We may surmise from Luke's account that this godly prophetess was cheerful and contented with her condition. She compares favorably with that famous Old Testament widow Naomi, who preferred to be called Mara, which means bitter, as in the book of Ruth. Although she had been married long enough to have children, Anna was possibly childless, either through barrenness or, if she was a hundred plus, through bereavement. In any event, she exhibited no bitterness or resentment towards God or others. Neither is there evidence of any strident feminism to make her a women's lib icon for future generations. Let that be carefully noted. Furthermore, unlike distrustful Naomi, who, with her husband and sons, left Israel in hard times, Anna did not forsake the land of promise. On the contrary, the God of Israel was her refuge and his temple was her home. She knew that the God who cares for widows, which is frequently taught in the Old Testament, Psalm 68 and 146 and Proverbs 15, she knew that the God who cares for widows would meet her every need. Of course, after her husband's death, she was free to marry again, as in Romans 7. Whether or not another man had found her attractive, her decision to remain single does not imply that she thought God's good gift of marriage was spiritually inferior. However brief had been her happiness, Anna had known and enjoyed, possibly, such love from a man whom she felt was irreplaceable. It is no less possible that she might have had an unhappy marriage. Thus she perhaps preferred to be single than sorry. Assuming the best, she was seemingly content with happy memories and the daily comfort of God's love. According to Paul's description of a model widow, she was also free, without an earthly husband, to trust completely in and continue in supplications and prayers night and day, as Paul teaches in First Timothy 5. Fifth, Anna's adoration. In view of Anna's perpetual spiritual devotion, she doubtless shared Simeon's longing to see the Messiah. It is unlikely that the old man had never told her of God's promise to him. Thus, on entering the temple, just as Simeon was praising God, she too, instantly recognizing the significance of his words, joined in thanksgiving. No sooner than their joyful songs had finished, Anna promptly began to spread the good news. Whether or not she gave thanks to to the Lord or to God, Luke's language clearly indicates that Anna knew that the babe in Simeon's arms was God incarnate. While many in Israel looked for a military Messiah, there were others besides Simeon and Anna who knew that their greatest need was redemption, that's the word that Luke uses. Redemption not from the Romans but from the ruin of sin and the power of Satan. Now that the Lord had suddenly come to his temple, as the prophet Malachi said he would, Anna was quick to share with her friends in Jerusalem the arrival of their blessed Redeemer. Despite the paucity of information about Anna, we know enough 
to see her as a precursor of the numerous godly women who have graced the pages of Christian history. The long list includes Augustine's mother Monica, Luther's widow Katie, the heroic Norwich martyr Cicely Orms, Richard Baxter's wife Margaret, Philip Doddridge's widow Mercy, Susanna Wesley, the mother of Methodism, as she was called, Selina, Countess of Huntingdon, and many others, not to forget missionaries like Mary Slessor and Gladys Aylwood. Perhaps Anna's piety shines with most eloquent beauty in the hymns of Anne Steele, who wrote Father of Mercies in Thy Word, What Endless Glory Shines, Adelaide Proctor, who wrote my God, I thank thee, who has made the earth so bright. Frances Ridley Havergal, who wrote, Lord, speak to me that I may speak. We began with her wonderful hymn. Jean Sophia Pigott, who wrote, Thou whose name is called it Jesus. What a glorious hymn about the Christian life that hymn is. And then Cecil Francis Alexander, author of the well-known There is a Green Hill Far Away. And lastly, Frances Van Alstein, or Fanny Crosby, she is known, who wrote, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Finally, let us thank God for Anna's happy testimony. Let us thank God for all such godly women. Let us care for widows, and also be sensitive to the loneliness of other single sisters whether divorced or otherwise, especially those who have suffered at the hands of cruel men. Let us all rejoice in that glorious redemption provided for all in the precious shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the beautiful story of Anna. A short story, but full of instruction, full of light, of comfort, especially also in these troubled times. May God bless us as we think about her and God's grace in her life. Amen.